Tel Aviv. You guys having fun? It's pretty good. All right. Uh, so my name is Dave Weston, uh, but you can call me D. Wizzle. That's what I actually prefer. It's a long story. Uh, I actually work in the uh, Windows Security Group, which means everything you like about Windows Security is, is due to me, and everything you hate is someone else's fault. So just, just remember that. So I'm going to talk to you today about how we're redefining security boundaries. I'm waiting. I'm going to see some smirks about that word. Uh, with hardware and Windows. How we're leveraging hardware, and it's kind of funny. I planned this talk before uh, the whole Spectre and Meltdown thing went public, so it's really fun that I came right after our friends from Austria, but how we're using hardware to redefine uh, Windows security. So how many of you are familiar with this t-shirt? This is a brilliant t-shirt. I have one in my office. Blank is a security boundary. And I see all the researchers right away laughing. Um, and what, what do we mean by a security boundary? Well, a security boundary is actually a really simple thing in, in principle. It is things that the operating system guarantees to the user, security properties that are guaranteed to the user uh, without question. And the way that we back that, we put currency behind a boundary is we guarantee if you send an email to secure at Microsoft, which you should always do, we will fix it. Now, that becomes interesting because where do you have the list of the security boundaries for Windows? Raise your hand if you know all the security boundaries for Windows. So we got 500 of some of the top security people in the world, and no one raised their hand. And that's because the last time I can find Microsoft documenting what we guarantee to the user is in 2007 from Mark Russ. So that's pretty interesting. So that's obviously caused a lot of confusions because there's a lot of security features that have been developed since 2007. Uh, and so my buddy Alex is, gives a big list of features here. UACO is being the top that are not security. They're security features, but they're not security boundaries. And I see Benjamin uh, laughing a lot about this. Uh, and then here's uh, uh, James saying, is PPL a security boundary with the obligatory, I don't know. Uh, and then, of course, there's Matt saying, well, this is even more confusing because I've heard Device Guard is not a security boundary, but they serviced some bugs I sent over to them. So what's the story here? Uh, and people care about this so much, there's actually fake news operations to get UAC to become a security boundary. So you can see there's actually a Twitter account called UAC is a security boundary. And you can tell this is fake news because they're saying UAC fixes Spectre and Meltdown. And that's even more concerning because CPUs are not a security boundary. So we've got a lot of problems here. So in effect, security boundaries are always changing. Now, this introduces another bug in the system. We have 10 immutable laws of security, right? Everybody here knows a little bit about computer science. In computer science, immutable means something that will never change. What's interesting is I see four to five things here, laws, that are probably pretty different than when this list was originally published back in the early 2000s. So things like, uh, if a bad guy can persuade you to run code on your machine, that machine is no longer safe. That doesn't really jive with things like code integrity, which I know Matt is going to talk to you about a little bit later today, or what you might experience on an iPhone or Android, where you can click away at an executable, and if it's, not, if, it's si if it's not signed, it's not going to run. If it's not running in a sandbox, it's not going to run. So that law doesn't seem to make as much sense nowadays. Additionally, we have things like if a bad guy has access to your machine, they're guaranteed to be able to control it. Again, that doesn't make a ton of sense when we're seeing things like million-dollar bootloader exploits for things like iPhones. So this, what, what's really happening is here is we're seeing these immutable laws don't work anymore, but we're not really reflecting modern promises around that. And this creates a lot of confusion. So if we look at one of those, a bad guy has access to physical access to your machine. It's not your machine anymore. That's a law. It shouldn't work. But we sort of muddied the waters there by saying, but there's this thing called BitLocker, and we've got Secure Boot, and these are mitigations that are designed to stop bad guys from accessing your machine. So how can you say it's an immutable law, but produce a feature that claims to fix that problem? Super confusing, I know. And again, that gets even more confusing, which is we, we see, uh, this is big news in the United States, there was a terrorist attack, someone uh, got access to the phone, we want information. It turns out that the Apple folks have done such a good job with physical access that you have to work with people to go and buy an exploit to work on that. And in particular, this is, this is interesting, is there's lots of research that is focusing on 
how you access physical machines and bypassing those security mechanisms. So this isn't making a lot of sense. We have an immutable law, but a bunch of security features that are claiming to violate that law and enforce it, and a bunch of people spending a lot of expertise to bypass those. It smells to me like something's a little out of whack here, and we should aspire to do a lot more. So can we do more? That's the question. Can Microsoft build something that meets all of these modern demands and overcomes maybe some of that debt? And it turns out we not only have built something that does that, it makes very strong guarantees. So what you see here is an Xbox One X. This is, in my opinion, one of the most secure consumer devices in the world. In fact, it's been in the market for several years, and we have yet to see someone, at least publicly, produce vulnerabilities for it. And there's a good reason why. There's actually a lot of security that's gone into that. So the first thing that's interesting about the Xbox One X is it assumes a threat model of unfettered physical access, violating immutable law of security number one, is you can own this machine, you can have it in your physical possession, you can take it home, but we guarantee, or we try to guarantee, that you cannot run code on this machine. Even if you want to hook up a JTAG, you've got an FPGA and voltage injection, that's hopefully not going to work because we do things like reset the machine when we find voltages are not in predictable levels. So we have done you know, glitch fuzzing, all of those things to make the Xbox One X impenetrable to physical access. So hardware is helping us with that. Number two, we have a custom sock that's got a high performance crypto processor. We can use that for things like memory encryption. We can put encryption operations all over the operating system without taking the conventional performance issues that would come from doing that purely in software. So again, it allows us to make a lot more guarantees about code only running signed, absolutely. In addition, part of that custom sock has a bunch of uh, extra hardware extensions that make virtualization very fast. So we can create a lot of virtual machines fast enough to run things like 60 FPS gaming in 4K. That's impressive. So we actually have numerous security domains that are fully isolated, guaranteed by a security boundary that cannot be violated through virtualization. Again, impressive security guarantees that are made by having custom hardware. Uh, and then finally, memory is actually, DRAM is actually encrypted on the device. So even being able to dump memory, getting physical access, is very unlikely, hopefully, to lead to any kind of access. So this is interesting is we've produced a device that violates all of the laws that arguably gives security folks what they want. How can we learn, uh, learn from that to produce a better Windows that it makes a more set of modern security promises? That's what we're going to dig into. So hardware when it doesn't have bugs, it gives us three things. The first is the ability to segment. So a very simple example of that is the TPM, the Trusted uh, uh, Computing Module on the machine that hosts most of your crypto keys, provides measurements. And we do that, we put it on hardware, because in, uh, in principle, it should be harder to access those keys even when you have full control of the machine. The second property that's very useful from a security standpoint is we can get performance from hardware. So if we build a specialized CPU, for example, if we put control flow integrity on the CPU, we have to emit less assembly, we have to run less code, and therefore, potentially, if, the, if there's specific hardware extensions for a particular mitigation, we have to be able to run that much faster than if we emitted it only in software. And so we get a performance guarantee, and that should allow us to uh, introduce a lot more security into the system without hurting the user experience at all. And that's cool. And then finally, Again, this is kind of a giggle, uh, given the last few months of firmware attacks, uh, code execution in Intel ME, processors having issues. Uh, but I would say in the general case, hardware is going to have a smaller attack surface. And particularly with hypervisors, the advantage we get is we can have a very small TCB, very small trusted computing base, which should mean less things can go wrong from a security perspective. So hardware gives us a bunch of cool properties. How can we actually use this to improve security? So, that is the question, is, is where can we use that? And Windows is actually a very interesting bird in this sense in that we have a lot of devices, a lot of different things. So not only do we want to make security guarantees that are consistent to address uh, some of the, the issues I, I showed at the top of the talk, but we also want that to be consistent across all sorts of devices, from IoT running in a refrigerator to a HoloLens 3D uh, AR type of experience to a 10S device, and that's a challenge. Uh, and so what we've done over time is we looked at this from a practical standpoint, and we said, this security boundary thing isn't the best. 
How can we communicate exactly where we want to go from a security standpoint um, long term? And we came up with six simple security promises that we think addresses this. So hopefully there won't be uh, too many more t-shirts. So the first security promise we aspire to make, be some time before we get there, is all code executes with integrity. That means we enforce code signing everywhere, and we enforce that runtime forward and rearward control flow integrity. The second promise, and this is going to be a tough one, is can we use things like secure biometrics and multi-factor authentication to make credential theft a thing of the past, especially with things like hardware segmentation and isolation? That is what we aspire to. In the third case, we want to say casual physical access, which means I lost my phone for 10 minutes, somebody was in my hotel room for 20 minutes. You know, I don't know that in consumer hardware, for the long term, we'll be able to stop JTAGs or, or fault injection, but at least for casual physical access, which would make most of us feel better going through you know, traversing international airports, et cetera, we want to make sure that uh, attackers with physical access can't steal data, can't inject code. An interesting property is we'd like to stop persistence overall. So again, pointing back to the Xbox, but also best of breed uh, security devices prevent today, they have immutable system partitions where one of the security guarantees they make is even if you fully compromise this device at runtime, a reboot will flush everything, return back to a known good state, and therefore attackers can't persist. And it's pretty hard to be an APT if you can't persist on the device in which you aspire to monitor. The fifth security principle or security promise we aspire to make is apps run and system services run in, in, in least privilege. So a compromise of a particular service should only compromise what that uh, service actually needed to have access to. Uh, and then the final, which is arguably the most important, is we'd like to be able to attest to the health and enforcement of all five of those properties. So this is obviously a tall order. But I wanted to share it with this room in particular where we think we're going, you know, to use kind of an uh, 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 overused term. This is the North Star for Windows security. So let's talk about how we're achieving that. How are we achieving uh, all code executes with integrity? So we have a four-pillared uh, strategy for this. The first is we want to prevent arbitrary code from running. And we do that in two ways. The first way is... Uh, something that you hear a lot about today, which is we use code integrity and enforcement to make sure that we know the provenance of all code and that that code only executes if the user wants it to by policy. The second thing is we want to ensure that at runtime, you can't just generate new code. So obviously, that's a challenge with things like jitters, but we've been able to solve that for particular use cases by moving jitters out of proc or deprivileging them. But in essence, we want to say that we can validate all code that's loaded, and you can't simply uh, go around that by generating new code at runtime. And we have two technologies today in Code Integrity Guard and Arbitrary Code Guard that guarantee that on the Windows platform when applied. The second dimension, which is uh, arguably just as important, is we want to ensure that you can't simply at runtime, if you can't generate new code, that you can't uh, execute code out of order. So you can't use um, ROP or JOP or COOP or whatever the passe term is today for uh, executing code out of order. So control flow guard enforces what we call forward control flow integrity, so jumps, calls. And we have a gap that exists for re uh, rear edge control flow integrity, which is stack returns, et cetera. So in essence, with these four pillars in place, we get uh, three important security properties. Only valid code can be run by an app. That code is immutable, can't be changed at runtime, and can't be generated. And that the code that does execute in those images executes in the way that we expected it. So that's pretty cool if we can enforce it. So the first thing that we've done uh, and that we've introduced, and I'll tell you a little bit about that later, but we introduced with Windows 10 is what we call hypervisor enforced code integrity. So this guarantees that kernel images mapped in the Windows kernel are, have a policy applied to them. And so here's a very simple sort of visualization for that. When an attacker wants to load a driver into a system with HVCI enabled, that uh, hypervisor first takes control uh, before mapping those pages, actually checks against the uh, authentic code code signing policy of that particular image, determines if the user has set any of those policies, if it's Microsoft signed, and goes through uh, numerous checks. And if that, those checks pass, only then will the hypervisor then tell the memory, uh, provide uh, page access to the memory manager to map that executable back into kernel, and that uh, page access, or the page protections on that mapping will be 
uh, execute and read only, so no write. And so that guarantees with those two uh, properties that the code that executes in the kernel is signed by Microsoft and that it can't be tampered with, and that's guaranteed by the hypervisor. So we've got a member, a, member, a, a small TCB there. The second attack, which I sort of skipped through there, is uh, if you want to eject code into a kernel, so say you wanted to do an attack like a Eternal Blue, you need to allocate at runtime on the kernel pool a place for your shell code, right? Or you need to change some page protections. That can't happen when HVCI is enabled because, again, the hypervisor is the gatekeeper using the uh, 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 page addressing system that prevents any requested allocation from including the, uh, the, the right execute permission. So the way that we do that today is we use two uh, hardware technologies. The first is what we call SLAT, or second level address uh, translation. And that essentially allows the hypervisor to gatekeep any requested access to a page for execute, read, write, and apply policies. So essentially what that means is the kernel is no longer the gatekeeper of its own memory. It has to ask the hypervisor for permission for anything it does. And that makes even a kernel level attacker, an administrator, again, an immutable law of security, the administrator can no longer just map anything into memory that it wants. The hypervisor is in control there. The second technology that's very interesting is we actually need two additional bits to manage all of these accesses and these page requests. And we can do that in software, but you can imagine, and from the previous uh, uh, presentation, you can see that page accesses and uh, address translations happen quite frequently. So having to manage those bits in software is pretty slow. So we worked with Intel and other hardware partners to add two bits, and we call this mode-based execution control, that allow us to set uh, user and kernel mode policy for a virtualized guest, which in this case is the, the user space and kernel uh, in VTL0. Uh, we manage that with this technology called MBAC, and it essentially means that we can run hypervisor-enforced code integrity with little to no performance impact. And that's huge for making it go mainstream. The second thing that we get from HVCI uh, when it's enabled is kernel control flow integrity. So that's kind of a fancy terminology. Let me explain what that means. Uh, kernel CFG essentially enforces an allow list of forward code, so jumps, calls, et cetera, at runtime. And it does that um, by first instrumenting code at compile time. So when a developer compiles, we actually create an allow list that's embedded in the binary that says, here's all the valid indirections that the developer needed to use, and we produce that list inside of the binary. When that binary is loaded by the kernel, it grabs that list of all the indirect uh, uh, valid control flows, and it makes sure through a, uh, CFG checks at runtime through instrumentation that all of the, the indirect control flow uh, uh, events that occur are valid for that binary. So they were what the developer predicted at runtime. Uh, and that's particularly interesting in the case of kernel because the attackers that we're trying to stop actually are assumed in our threat model to have full control of the kernel. So in the kernel space, that's interesting to say, I'm going to restrict the attacker from kernel from reading or writing memory that runs at kernel. Right? There's no, <laughs> there's no uh, sort of boundary there at all. And so what we do in the case of KCFG is we actually use the hypervisor to protect the CFG bitmap. It turns out that when we were originally looking at kernel uh, control flow guard and its value, I uh, put our red team folks on it. And what they came up with is if they had read-write primitive in the kernel, which is pretty conventional for most exploits, they could just target the kernel CFG bitmap at runtime. And since they were both running at kernel, they could change the bits to anything they want. That's not a really great defense. Uh, and so the great Dave Cutler saw that and in like a weekend turned out a patch for protecting that bitmap with the HVCI hypervisor. And in the end, we are now able to strictly enforce control flow integrity uh, in the Windows kernel. And that's super important for things like this code snippet you see up here, which is uh, Eternal Blue, which is really the engine behind WannaCry and not Petya. We know for a fact that the corruption, uh, the function pointer corruption that happens, at least in the sample that we have, can be protected through KCFG, which is a huge win. Uh, and because we know this is so important to continue to stay ahead of attackers, we've actually enabled virtualization-based security by default in all Windows SKUs for the upcoming version of Windows. That means if you get a new PC and it has MBEC, which is currently KB Lake plus Intel uh, systems, there's no performance hit, and we enable this by default. 
This is something that used to be in the enterprise-only space and was uh, not on by default. So by broadly enabling this mitigation, obviously Windows 10 stayed ahead of Eternal Blue and the uh, WannaCry attacks, but we're really betting on this technology to help us stay ahead of attackers for the next generation of attacks. Now, nothing comes for free, especially in security. I think most of you folks know that. So virtualization-based security is a great technology, but it's not without some downsides, especially from a security perspective. There's actually a really obvious, if you're an attacker, gap in what uh, 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 VBS provides today, and that is firmware is sort of the weakest link in that chain. So one of the things that VBS seeks to provide is making sure that we have this secure segmentation of secrets, code integrity policy, control flow, uh, bitmaps that even the administrator can't tamper with. But an administrative level attacker can do things to firmware and find vulnerabilities and exploit that. Firmware, particularly SMM, or supervised uh, memory, is actually available to kernel attackers through uh, various kind of programming interfaces that we call SMIs. Uh, and so here's an example, again, of where we learn what the issues are there and what can be done by an attacker through red teaming. So about two years ago, we did an evaluation of device guard on a, a latest Surface device at that time. Uh, and I sat down with our red team and gave them a blank slate. And of course, they landed on probably the best way to bypass credential guard or bypass HVCI is to target firmware. Uh, and most of us know who have sort of kept up on research, you know, firmware isn't the most understood technology out there. Uh, a lot of the folks who are developing firmware may not be as security conscious as others. They might be focused on other priorities. And so that makes it a good target for attackers. And so that's exactly, in this case, what our internal red team did, as well as two other different researchers who published their findings on using SMM to target VBS. Uh, and the great thing from an attacker perspective about SMM is if you can find vulnerabilities, you can actually execute anywhere in memory. So if you just corrupt image memory for SMM, you can inject, a, uh, you can inject an implant in there, you can run shellcode, and that shellcode is really running at ring minus one, so it can tamper the hypervisor. It has uh, physical memory access to almost the entire machine. So SMM is actually a big vector. The good news is that we've been making substantial investments on making writing S secure SMM and other forms of secure firmware easier. So the first thing that we did, and this was introduced in the uh, uh, two releases ago in Windows, is something we call the security mitigations table for SMM. And it's actually a really cool and simple thing that firmware developers can do. They can uh, establish and, and set the properties in this table at compile time. And then what the uh, Windows hypervisor and kernel will do is enforce things like uh, uh, where SMM has access to write to at runtime. So I'll give you a very simple example. If you're familiar with probe for read in the kernel space, which basically says, if you pass me a pointer and I probe it, I'm going to make sure that uh, uh, the pages are available, that you're not going to have a page fault, and that it's either kernel mode or user mode memory, and I'm going to guarantee that back to you. So we actually provide the same thing for SMIs at runtime with this mitigation. We guarantee that SMIs that have pointers out to user as a host mode will be discoverable, and that should prevent exploitation of very common uh, SMM-related vulnerabilities. In the future, we're actually doing a ton more here. So you'll see a theme throughout this is we're partnering with hardware vendors to get exactly the mitigations we need embedded in the hardware. So we've actually been working with Intel um, to enable paging in SMM, which would uh, allow us to prevent uh, common exploitation of SMM level vulnerabilities from writing system code at all. We can also attest to the security of SMM at runtime because today, if we get into SMM at runtime, it's kind of like a ghost, it's stealth. We don't have instrumentation in there, we can't see it, and that's why really advanced attackers tend to favor SMM uh, exploitation. But in the next generation of hardware, again, working with Intel and other partners, we believe that we can solve some of these fundamental or common classes of issues through paging and other mitigations. Um, that is not the only place that we can actually help with the firmware problem. The second thing that's very easy to do that I encourage most people to go and look at, whether your PC has this, is we need capsule firmware updates. If we learned anything from the, uh, the events of the last couple months related to hardware vulnerabilities is we need a way to respond in the ecosystem very quickly and patch firmware, patch CPU microcode, et cetera. Uh, 
The great thing here is uh, Windows Update actually supports capsule updates for vendors, which means we can eventually get into the cadence where Patch Tuesday were able to ship proactively security issue updates for not just the Windows software, but for the core trusted computing base that includes firmware. So a lot's happening there. Uh, and then the third thing to give credit to Intel is they actually have a firmware bounty for Tiano Core components or the common baseline components or open source version of their Eufy firmware. And so if you find a vulnerability in there, which I encourage all of you to go and look at, uh, you can get some very nice bounty payouts from Intel. So that's a pretty awesome thing. So moving on, return address protection is the second part of control flow integrity, right? It's not just about protecting jumps and calls, it's also about protecting the stack. And we know that attackers who want to evade CFG or other control flow integrities, uh, integrity enforcement will just target the stack. They'll go and look in that direction. They can make a ROP change just as easily from corrupting the stack as they can from forward edge integrity. Um, again, this is something that we are very aware of. We learned from uh, both looking at the ecosystem and zero day attacks we saw in the wild, evading, attempting to evade CFG, but also from contests like Pwn to Own where we get these sort of brain trust of the best exploitation people on the planet, and we were able to learn from their techniques. And so we were able to see that this rear, uh, rear control flow integrity or targeting the stack was a gap in our security strategy. And so our first attempt there was to implement this in software. So uh, Jordan, Matt, other folks that are, are here in the audience, and you should go talk to them about this, they invented a technology we called Return Flow Guard, RFG. And it was based on information hiding in software uh, because we didn't have hardware extensions to support this at the time. Uh, and in the end, what we did is we red teamed that for some time, and we actually found out, based on our view of the threat model, that this just wasn't going to be resilient, and we got right up to the edge of shipping it and pulled it out. That, I like to say that's one of the proudest moments I had at Microsoft is we actually had invested tons and tons of time into this mitigation, but rather than throw another, this is not a security boundary on the heap, we actually pulled it out. And we didn't wait for the security community to go and find this issue. We actually did it proactively ourselves through our offensive security investments. So that was really cool. Now, the positive silver lining through that failure as well is we were able to partner with Intel to come up with what is basically essentially a hardware version of this, this shadow stack. It's actually a very simple technology in practice. When you have a call a, a, or a jump or some sort of a, a control flow indirection, a return address is normally popped on the stack. Uh, you've done sort of CS101, that's how a stack works. Well, conceptually in the Intel model, we now have a hardware stack that matches this software stack that's immutable. So every time you make a call, there's a return address put on the main stack, there's one put on the hardware-backed shadow stack, and we're able to compare and contrast when there's a return back from that stack entry to make sure that the return address that's, being, that's re redirecting control flow is what we predicted or what was on the hardware shadow stack. So that means even an attacker who can fully corrupt the software stack will eventually le uh, be hit with an error and the machine will crash when we validate the shadow stack. So that effectively gives us rearward control flow integrity, which is the biggest gap we have today. Again, one of the advantages we have with working with Intel in this particular case is software would be expensive. In fact, when we implemented this in software, we had to have prologues and epilogues that did a lot of this checking. When we work with Intel, they can implement this in the microcode or architecturally to do this with very little performance uh, hit, and they can, again, segment the, the, the hardware shadow stack so that an attacker can't corrupt it. So in the end, we get a very robust uh, gap filler here for real-world control flow integrity, and that's pretty great. So I'm going to have to move along here at a, at a good pace. Um, again, what we're doing for malicious code persistence. So today we have a, sec a secure boot. So Secure Boot's a great technology. Um, it actually validates that all of the core components that start up in the machine from your UFI firmware to the Windows bootloader to the hypervisor are actually signed correctly, and that's great. Where that strategy can have issues is, again, where OEM firmware or uh, where firmware that is not up to security snuff is actually in that chain of trust. Uh, and so there's been some great uh, security research from folks uh, previous at Intel, folks like Alex Mastrov, who have looked deeply into this and shown us that there's literally dozens of vulnerabilities sitting out there for early boot. So it's going to be very hard for us to bring up the system in an attestable way and have a true TCB that we can trust if we have lots of vulnerabilities that can be easily used to bypass secure boot. That's not a great statement. So this static root of trust is sort of getting long in the tooth, uh, 
and it's hurting us from making stronger guarantees about uh, malicious code not being able to persist. So again, we were able to work with a hardware vendor to look at a better way of doing this. Uh, and it turns out the Intel TXT, or Trusted Execution Extensions, actually have the ability to create what's called a dynamic root of trust. So rather than having to trust all of the components at boot, we can simply choose an arbitrary point in time when Microsoft code starts to run, call uh, an SNIT instruction, which is a special instruction, and have all of that measured into the TPM. And then we can compare through these special MSR registers um, whether or not, uh, 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 sorry, PCR registers, whether or not the code that's running is the code that we expected. And that gives us a very powerful way to make sure that the hypervisor comes up correctly, the Windows kernel comes up correctly, all of the critical system binaries come up correctly without having to trust Eufy code at all. So another way to say that is you could have a full Eufy exploit, and this would still detect it and fail to boot. On top of that, another very nice property that we get here is the ability to provide that information back to an access control system. So our attestation logs will not only be able to tell us whether or not the early boot components were tampered with, but also uh, provide that to an external party who can decide to reject access to that machine. So this is a very, very powerful way of saying, even an advanced attacker who's got a UFI exploit is not going to be able to persist on this device, at least in the early boot code. And we think this gives us a huge advantage over attackers going forward. So again, we're targeting multiple future, future versions of Windows here. This takes a lot of firmware and hardware support. And so a common theme I think you should expect from Microsoft, or, and particularly Windows in the future, is these sort of incremental components. We've moved to Windows as a service, where we're giving you two new updates a year. But that means we can't just sit there for three years and do a complicated feature. We have to sort of break it apart. Uh, and so this is a great example where like, if you looked in some of the code today, and I know there's some tweets that have indicated that people are doing that, you'll see that part, part of the scaffolding is there. And this is something that we think we can sort of roll over time uh, and make very powerful. Now, this is a particularly interesting one, is we'd like to make the security claim that attackers with casual physical access can't control your device. We're not necessarily in a great space there today. Many of you will be familiar with some of the great work from folks like Ulf, who create things like PCI leech, which means if you have an exposed uh, DMA port, you can simply plug into a Windows device. And if that device doesn't have, say, an IOMMU enabled, you can read arbitrary memory, including credentials, bit locker secrets, et cetera. Not ideal, makes you a little concerned about the physical control of your laptop. We'd like to move on past that and be able to uh, make much stronger security claims. And one of the ways we're doing that is through what we call DMAR, DMA remapping technology. It's actually quite simple. DMA remap, remapping means a driver vendor who's providing, say, a Thunderbolt port simply uh, re-architects their driver to be compatible with DMAR. And then we do not allow a device plugged into, say, a Thunderbolt port to have access to system memory unless the user unlocks their machines, types in their credentials, and authorizes that. And of course, that's even stronger if that machine is protected by something like Windows Hello and you, you're backed by secure biometrics, right? You've got to have a thumbprint, an iris, or multiple factors to get access to DMA. And so what that means is I can't just walk up to your machine and do the, the uh, old plug in the PCI Express or uh, uh, the Thunderbolt uh, port and simply start snarfing things off of the machine. Instead, the user's got to be able to authorize and access all of that. And so that's a huge, huge change. It will probably take multiple release cycles to get all the driver vendors up to, up to snuff there. But with our 1803 release in March, you will see us marching towards this goal of saying casual physical access is no longer a, you know, a death sentence for a Windows machine. And that is absolutely huge. Uh, and I also want to call out that we're starting with Thunderbolt there, which is arguably the most common. So um, with that, I want to go and talk about another security property, which is isolation. This is very, very critical for a modern operating system. If you look at Android, a Chrome OS, and iOS, all of the components on those operating systems, for uh, better or worse, are actually isolated in sandboxes and also have their kernel access restricted. So in Windows, we aspire to do something similar. And we actually have two uh, isolation technologies today. The first is software, and that's called App Container. So App Container is actually a great sandbox. Uh, products like Microsoft Edge run in there and have their uh, resources constrained in the event of successful exploitation. 
and our, we've continually invested in that sandbox to reduce the attack uh, surface. And we're now down about 90% from where we started when Microsoft Edge was launched. And so it's a great technology, but it has some limitations. In the Windows world, you know, we've got 20 years of applications that need to continue to run. And so it makes it very difficult for us to use strategies of kernel isolation like authoring system call filtering, which is the common thing to do on other platforms, because applications still need to access a lot of those system calls, and exposing that to app developers is challenging. So when we looked at what other platforms were doing to get kernel isolation, we just decided that that wouldn't work for a Windows world. So instead, we decided with our superpower of owning an operating system, a compiler, and a hypervisor to sort of redefine what it means to isolate an application. Most importantly, what we were going for here is combining user space isolation with the ability to uh, isolate the kernel. And our goal there was to prevent very common kernel-level exploitation attacks from leading to sandbox escapes. And it turns out we were hit with a flurry of riches for options. You know, Windows doesn't ever have one technology. They have five, you have five to choose from. And to make it even more confusing, we name all of our container technologies with elements, which if you were watching, say, John's talk yesterday, you know we name our adversary tracking with elements as well. So you can combine, say, uh, argon containers with argon the adversary. Anyway, that's a Microsoft joke. Um, so uh, I guess on your left-hand side are two container technologies that are software-based. So they use user-based session isolation or just plain old uh, sort of hooking-based virtualization for apps. So that's cool for something like you know, deploying a Docker container. It's not the best for virtualization, or sorry, for kernel isolation. On the right-hand side, we have two different Hyper-V-based container technologies that provide really sound kernel isolation but have various challenges of resource consumption. Remember, our goal here is to take every single thing on the operating system and make it isolated both from kernel and user space. So we want to look for a technology that's going to enable uh, some great density there. So it turns out that Krypton was a technology we selected because it's got our kernel isolation uh, and it's very slim. And I'll tell you why it's slim from a resource perspective. The first thing that's really interesting about a Krypton container, and this is the technology that backs our uh, application virtualization, virtualization security technology called WDAG, or Windows Defender Application Guard. Uh, it has a technology called Direct Map, and this is really cool. It means when we spin up a Windows container, it doesn't need to have its own VHD. In fact, you can run a container that's 16 megabytes for the entire VHD. The way it does that is by sharing binaries with the parent operating system. So when we boot up a container, we don't just, you know, do load library on the existing binaries that are on the system, we simply ask the memory manager for that image, and if it's already loaded on the host, it's instantaneously physically mapped into the guest, which means essentially our VHD is 16 megabytes of reg registry entries because the rest of the binaries are shared with the host. That's a superpower and probably something only Microsoft can do and keeps the disk image of a container very low and something within striking distance of running all applications in. The second thing we did that's really cool is we moved away from what's called physically mapped VMs, where if you need a two gig uh, gigabyte VM, you're taking two gigabytes of physical memory. That is not going to be great if you're trying to run hundreds of these things. Instead, we made paged back memory. We enlightened Windows at the core to understand a container and simply hand out pages as that container needs. The reason that's really cool is we're basically making containers approximate a process, which is hey, you just ask the NT kernel for some page mem uh, memories or some other resources, and it works. And that makes containers really a first-class citizen in the modern versions of Windows. And similarly, we uh, enlightened the integrated scheduler so we could do things like pause processes or threads that are running in the container from the host to save battery life. So in combination, these things really make containers a first-class security feature. I'm going to run through this really quickly, but one of the, you know, the gaps, I would say, in running a container-based uh, system like this is you don't get all the niceties of having uh, some of the things that require kernel access, so things like access to hardware for GPU acceleration, et cetera. Uh, in the latest version of Windows, we actually created a technology that uses the IOMMU to safely extend GPU hardware access into the container while guaranteeing that even in the event of a GPU compromise, the IOMMU will prevent that GPU 
from tampering with or corrupting any of system memory. So that basically means that the GPU memory is ring fenced, and when an inevitable GPU or shader based kind of attack, um, some sort of bug in a, in a, uh, in a GPU, uh, manifests itself, it'll actually be ring fenced by the IOMMU and hopefully be fairly benign. So this is an example where we're changing kind of the physics of what it means to run virtualization in the system. And then the final thing which I'm the most excited about is the progress we're making on observing violations of any of the security properties I showed you previously. Tampering is a really big risk in Windows. We have lots of components that we want there to be all the time to make sec the security guarantees. A good example of that is we use protected processes to prevent tampering of things like Defender, Defender ATP, the firewall. All of the critical TCB base of Windows are contained in what are called PPL, or protected process light. The downside of PPL is it's only as effective as you can prevent kernel, uh, kernel code. And as you might guess, administrators can simply load drivers to remove that um, C immutable security property number seven. So that's kind of a bummer. So in order to make this, these uh, uh, stronger guarantees around tampering, we have various technologies that have made a dent. You know, one in particular is things like DHA or device health attestation that will tell you whether or not the operating system booted in the capacity we expected it. Uh, and then things like patch guard that use obfuscation or in the case of hyperguard uh, virtualization to create continuous attestation of various kernel memory and determine whether or not it's been tampered with. And if it's been tampered with, restart the box. So that's a cool technology, but it's not very extensible. It's not very easy to extend it to cover, say, a new security feature that we introduce that we want to prevent from tampering. And because Defender ATP has been so successful in the wild at stopping red teams and attackers, one of the first places we're seeing activity and targeting of uh, uh, of integrity is on uh, Defender. So this is actually Chris Thompson, who's over at X-Force, did an excellent paper on tampering with ATP, and he used two techniques. The first technique is he used kind of Benjamin's technique of loading a signed driver in a kernel and removing PPL from e-process, making it tamperable. An old trick, well known, but it works on PPL all the time. The second thing is even simpler, which is you can simply turn off network access or various forms of network access to ATP and make sure that if there isn't a detection on a machine, it simply doesn't get to the cloud where you can raise an alert and tell the system administrator what happened. So two very simple techniques that work because of immutable laws of security. So how, how can we change that? So what we really need, and our new goal, is to create a tamper-evident version of Windows. So it is probably a truism for the architecture we have today that an administrator is essentially overlord of the system and can do whatever they want. But using technologies like the hypervisor and secure enclaves, we can at least observe what this lord of the land is doing and report on it to people who might uh, assign various versions of trust to that user. And so the goal is to make sure that if somebody does tamper with the system, it's at least observable. And to do that, we've created a new technology based on secure enclaves that we call system guard uh, runtime attestation. So what is an enclave? Well, there's actually an API in Windows that allows developers to load code either into a virtualization-backed secure enclave that's protected from, from even kernel-level attackers, or an Intel SGX-level enclave, which again, we saw a great talk on that yesterday, to run code that's encrypted and protected in user mode. So, in order to advance the state of the art in our EDR technology and prevent it from tampering, we actually created a set of an attestation engine that runs inside of this enclave. And the really cool thing about this is it's actually just a scripting runtime that can be eventually dynamically updated. It's fully protected, again, going back to the boot level security attestation and promises we can make there. It's actually protected from kernel level attackers. And we can use key exchange, SecureX key exchange at initialization to encrypt and sign attestations back and forth from this enclave that the attacker can't tamper with. So in essence, what this means is if you were to turn ATP off or Defender off or any of these other key systems, that would need to be sent back to the cloud. And if that information is tampered with at all or doesn't reach the cloud, you'll likely very quickly lose access. So another way of saying that is if you turn off Defender ATP in the future, you'll simply lose all access to the cloud. That's incredibly effective for tampering and gives us a mechanism to combat evil administrators. So we're very excited about that. And you can actually see there are three different attestations in the new version of ATP just available here. 
things using PPL tampering, um, techniques from James Forshaw and Kiwi to remove PPL, uh, and as well as code injection into PPL enclaves. All of that is detectable and attestable from this uh, system guard runtime technology and can be reported to the cloud. So really quickly, I'm out of time here, but I wanted to wrap up by saying, you know, Windows is doing a lot to integrate hardware security into the core of, the, uh, of our security promises. In the new version of Windows 1803, we actually have a very simple dialogue where you can go and see what are all the security features I have enabled for this device and what is it doing for me as a user. That makes it much more transparent of what security features you have on your device. And of course, 10S is our sort of revamped version of Windows where we can innovate for all of these technologies, get them on by default. We're not as encumbered with some of the legacy restrictions that make that security boundary uh, discussion difficult. Uh, and because of that, most of the aspirational promises you'll see here will first manifest in 10S. Uh, and with that, I want to you know, invite all the folks in this room who are interested in these technologies to join us. We have lots of jobs in both the Windows and Cloud and Enterprise group that you can read here. Uh, another thing I wanted to do is have an exclusive announcement. Uh, this will be actually be going public in the next day or so, but Microsoft has partnered with ZDI and Trend to actually stand up a security a bounty this year on top of the regular Pwn to Own. We're inviting you to come and exploit a lot of the technologies you saw here today. Tell us about it and get paid large sums of money. What could be better than that? Thank you. Appreciate it. Sorry for running over.